This program is made possible by the loyal financial support of the friends and partners of Family Policy Institute. Good evening and welcome to Watchmen on the Wall. Thank you for joining us. Tonight it's my great privilege, as always, to welcome into the studio the members of Parliament of the ACDP, that is the African Christian Democratic Party. So I want to welcome Reverend Kenneth Meshu, who is the president of the ACDP. Welcome, uh, Reverend. Good to have you in the studio. Thank you very much for having me. And then Sherilyn Dudley, MP. Good to have you, Sherilyn. Good evening, Errol. And Steve Swat. Good evening, Errol. Good to have you all here again. We want to talk, obviously, about the opening of Parliament and SONA, the State of the Nation address that happened uh, on the 11th of February. Uh, there was a number of antics by the EFF. Very surprised to see a uh, COP member, Mr. Lakota, storm out of Parliament as well. We didn't expect that. But I want to just talk about the EFF and their tactics, because uh, many people believe this is deliberate tactics of the EFF to disrupt parliament and to grab media attention and to say whatever they need to say. Um, Pastor Kenneth, do you think it's working? Well, it does give them um, media coverage, and that's what they want. But it is at the same time working against them because there are many people out there who are getting tired of the disrespect they see coming from them and also the delaying tactics and causing parliament to waste time unnecessarily. So even though it gives them media coverage, but it is working against them because there are people who believe that it is important for the president to be heard so that opposition members can respond accordingly. Mm. We also cannot respond to what the president is supposed to have said if he didn't say it. So any opportunity we get to respond to what the president has said is a welcome opportunity. So those tactics are going to catch up with them. People are going to say, we don't want to see your childish behavior. We want to hear what the president is saying, because many people in the country are concerned about where this country is going, about what's happening in the country, and they are looking for answers. And they know that when the president stands during SONA, he has to give direction and answers. So. We are not excited by what's happening. Actually, we are saddened to see how the rules of parliament are broken, the decorum of parliament is undermined, the dignity of parliament is undermined, to hear people talking about the circus. Even this morning, as I was coming here, people at the airport said to me, hey, we enjoyed that circus again last week. I said, mm -hmm. well, it is sad for you to talk about circus because mm -hmm. that's a place where laws of the land should be made. That's a place where seriousness and where people should engage one another in order to make South Africa a better place. So we are not impressed by those tactics, and we are hoping that people on the ground with this coming election will say to them, we are tired of mm. what you're doing. We want serious-minded people in parliament who will help solve our problems. Mm. Sherilyn, uh, were you surprised at the level of security, the Ring of Steel, with special forces, police, riot squad, military? Were you surprised at that? No, absolutely not. And for two reasons. One is I think we would have been completely irresponsible if Parliament hadn't ensured, knowing what we know, mm. um, that things would be able to proceed if necessary. Whatever needed to be done would have to be done. It's also, you know, a, an important thing for every country to be proud of its its military and its police and, and all of these things. And so the, it, all of that appearance of, of that is something that is important. I think that we should actually have a sense of um, decorum. It's a sense of decorum, but also just a sense of being proud of who we are and as a nation and that we, we really are being responsible. You know, you were talking about um, tactics that are, are specific to the EFF. Now, obviously, people know that this is a game they're playing, but they also know that they said so before they got into Parliament, that this is exactly what they were going to do, and they keep doing it. They told the media before um, the opening, before the SONA address, that this is what they were going to do. So there were no surprises. They, they did what they said they were going to do. 
Even Cope was no surprise because Cope um, is, shows some pretty desperate um, tactics generally in Parliament, and there is there is this kind of vying for the attention of the media. And, and so uh, there's no surprises for us who are sitting there. We, we, we know who's going to actually do whatever it takes to get that media attention. You know, there are some people who are saying South Africa is becoming a police state. When they see the number of security forces there, the military, they say, are we becoming a police state? Now, the question is, should we become a lawless, rebellious country? And obviously, we don't want that. We believe order must be maintained, even though we do not want police to deny people the rights to demonstrate. Even demonstrations and protests must be done uh, with dignity, so, without undermining the rights of others, without destroying property and so on. So we as the ACDP welcome the presence of law enforcement agents to make sure that when people go to parliament, they are not inconvenienced, they are not hurt, they are not um, attacked unnecessarily. So we are glad that the police were there to ensure that law and order was maintained. Yeah, because the one thing I noticed, uh, Steve, was that um, you know our cameras were out in in uh, Darling Street and the parade, and there was fights between ANC supporters and EFF supporters, destroying property, breaking benches yeah. to get poles yeah. to hit each other. Yeah. They were shooting stun grenades, and all of that was happening out there. And when you were in the parliamentary precincts, you didn't you wouldn't know what was going on because it was quiet and dignified. So it does look like the security. Did help yeah. and and to 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 protect absolutely yeah. and it did help but regrettably as as all the international cameras were also looking what was going on in the city centre mm. and I'm not sure whether all those protest actions should have been allowed knowing that there'd be conflicting rights between ANC EFF supporters there was a third march and even for us to move in safe uh, cars from the castle to Parliament was in itself a bit of a challenge because of some of the incidents that took place along the way. Mm, mm. But I think it is very important. The decorum of parliament is something that we maintain because people would, it, it gives a sense of legitimacy, gives a sense of that this is where laws are made. And I think that is why the media were looking so very carefully. We understand that there were almost 800 applications for media as opposed to 400 in the past. That's right. So the eyes of South Africa, the eyes of the world were on parliament. And so I just want to endorse my colleagues that it was very regrettable that the EF again yeah. tried to disrupt Parliament. I've said it in Parliament that they are there to disrupt Parliament. Everyone wanted to hear what the state president sure. had to say. Leaders are dealers in hope, and we were hoping that he would bring hope to a nation that is crying out for hope and credible leadership. Now, coming back to that leader and the state of the nation address, did he say anything that uh, Pastor Kenneth that would bring hope to the people of South Africa uh, at the opening of Parliament? Well, not hope. Uh, whatever he has said did not uh, bring hope. Uh, there were statements that were uh, in the right direction, uh, positive things that were in the right direction, if I may give an example, where he spoke about cutting costs. I mean, he mentioned things that we were concerned about in the past, that so wasting money with the, all these parties, you know, after budget votes and also these big uh, delegations of going overseas and so on. That, that's a lot of money that has been wasted. Right. So it, it was a positive thing for him to say we are going to cut down on this. But obviously we know that that's a fraction of the cuts that needs to be made. The biggest area we believe where a lot of cuts have to be made is in his bloated cabinet. His cabinet is unnecessarily too big. And many of the cabinet ministers in there, we are not sure what they're doing because on the ground you cannot see their practical contribution. So if he cuts there, that's where millions will be saved, not per year, but every month. Mm. And uh, so it was a step in the right direction, but it didn't go far enough. It didn't that's go far I mean. enough. Yeah, didn't Chitlin, go. so what do you think about his suggestion that we have one capital? We're perhaps suggesting that they move parliament from Cape Town to Pretoria and have the executive and the legislative base there. Well, it was interesting to see um, Premier Helen Zilla's face. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed. At the mention of that. You but you know, from the minute I came to Parliament in mm. 1999, and Steve and I, the same year, that was being said then, and it's being said now. So, and I have not, as a member of Parliament, and as a whip of smaller parties and of the ACDV, I've not seen any specific moves in that direction. So, 
whilst I think that the ANC would love to be able to do that right now, and it kind of you know, pushes the finger in the face of the DA, I'm not sure that that's entirely possible for that to be done in any great hurry. But, but yeah. will it save billions? You know, I think it would save quite a bit because um, the oversight role of committees is really important. And those committees try to do their job diligently, which means that they put a lot of pressure on departments. And they have got whole um, delegations from, from um, the departments running backwards and forwards. And mm. if we don't like what they've presented to us, we just send them away and tell them to come back. That's big money. That's, sure. you know, so whilst it's important in terms of oversight, it's a lot of money. Um, if they were around the corner and they had to go back and come back with <laughs> the, the better um, presentation, well, it, it would definitely be a lot less costly. You know, one of the challenges that they are facing, government is going to face on this matter, is that there are millions of people on the waiting list who are saying we want houses. Now, if they know the amount of money that would be spent in making another parliament, building another parliament in Pretoria, while they have been waiting on for houses for 20 years, yes. people are going to revolt. You know, it, it, or long term, it would be a good thing to do, but definitely not short term. And it was interesting also to hear the current deputy, uh, the, the Speaker of Parliament, Balika Mbeta, saying it will not happen the next 10 years. And she's right. It will not happen the next 10 years. So the glaring issue is in Kandla. And obviously the court case at the Constitutional Court that was heard uh, on the 9th of uh, February, two days before Sona. And I think uh, what we just heard from the President's lawyers and the other counsel in that court case was that the report by the public protector is in fact legally binding. Oh, absolutely, Errol. And from the word go, the ACDP was very clear on this issue. From a legal standpoint, the public protector's report was clearly binding. Mm -hmm. Her remedial action was binding on the president. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to remember what she said, that he must pay back a reasonable amount. From that day on, she was vilified, she was attacked, yeah. she was criticized, and every possible mechanism was used with its parliament, with its executive, with parallel investigations to discredit that finding. So, so what do you think about the, the police minister's report? Now no, that, that well, it, thing it, has it means nothing. To and, be and, and regrettably, when, we, when I traveled to Encanto last year, I argued again, as a lawyer myself, the legal position, that if her remedial action and her finding is not binding, then she might as well close her offices. And I argued that. and. We made it very clear that her finding cannot be trumped by the Minister of Police's report. Regrettably, it was steamrolled through by the ANC in the ad hoc committee and then accepted by Parliament. I warned in Parliament and I pleaded with the MPs. I said, don't allow Parliament again to be overridden by courts. Because this is the tendency that we are seeing. And from my side, it's a welcome tendency. Because if Parliament is not doing its duty properly, then the courts upholding the rule of law, will then overturn what Parliament is doing, what the executive is doing. And mm. I said, please do not do that, because this is what is going to happen. I said, it's very clear that President Zuma does not have to repay 246 sure. million, but a reasonable amount. Mm. Now, and they were, very, they were acceptable, and that is what the court has now found. Now, all of those efforts by Parliament, the committees that they set up, the police, all of those has been discredited by the very fact that the president himself has acknowledged that he has to pay back the money by saying, I will pay back part of that money. But we run out of time in the segment. When we come back, we'll continue this uh, discussion. So stay with us. Don't go away. More with the ACDP after the break. <music> Welcome back to the program. I'm speaking to the ACDP members of parliament, Reverend Kenneth Meshu, Sherilyn Dudley, and Steve Swat. Now, Steve, we were talking about the constitutional case that was heard on the 9th of February. How do you think they're going to rule, having heard everything you heard as a lawyer? Well, listening carefully to the concessions that were made by President Zuma's counsel, it's very clear that firstly, the constitutional court will state that the findings of the public protector are binding unless set aside by review by a court of law. And secondly, that President Zuma has to pay back a reasonable amount, which was those terms were agreed between the parties. And that amount will be determined by the Auditor General and an official from National Treasury. So it is what we argued from the word go. It's not the full 200 million. Mm. It is a reasonable amount by which his estate has been enriched. And we also know at the same time 
There's other litigation against the architect and other people that were involved to recover the balance of the money. So that, we believe, will serve justice. We are grateful that the rule of law is upheld. And as I said in Parliament to the ANC, I said, the truth will set you free. And at the end of the day, this is what the Constitutional exactly Court what is will happening. uphold. So yes. Thank God you're there and you're speaking the word of God into <laughs> Parliament. Now, Pastor Kenneth, um, I think Julius Malema has a problem because the public protector, Tulu Madinsela, has released a report on him and the Limpopo government and the Ratananga Trust and what they found in there is that this on-point engineering company was created just before that tender of 52 million rand in, in Limpopo province. There were a number of professional companies that tendered. They were all disqualified on minor technicalities like misspelled words, front page wasn't right, didn't have two doc, uh, duplicates. And they gave it to On Point, and her investigation shows that they, ne they never existed a week before the tender. They had no assets, no money, no banking account, no staff, no nothing, but they were giving a, given a 52 million rand tender. Now, this, this means that Julius Malema was repeatedly saying in the media that uh, the public protector's report is binding, legally binding, and you cannot override it. Now there's a report against him. What is the next step? Well, he has to pay back also. He's the one who has been screaming and shouting, pay back the money, pay back the money. After the president has paid back that portion that he will have to pay, he and the ANC members are going to start singing the chorus to him, pay back the money, pay back the money. This just highlights the corruption that is in the tendering system. There are many people who are not qualified many people who do not have assets and experience like this, uh, his company, who are given tenders because they're politically connected. Yes. So they will have to pay back the money. And Christians out there will have to realize that money is being lost. Millions of money and billions are being lost because of corruption. It is high time that many people who believe in righteousness start thinking about bringing righteousness into government. Mm. As you know, that the scripture says, righteousness exalts the nation. That's right. For Christians to continue complaining, then say there's too much corruption, there's too much corruption. It's time that they need to take responsibility and admit the fact that um, we are the salt. And so one of the functions of salt is to prevent corruption. So those who have been saying, pay back the money, are going to have now ANC comrades sing the same song to them, pay back the money. That's right. Now that brings me, Steve, to the economy. And uh, I think uh, the focus of most of South Africans is on the economy. The economy has weakened substantially since mm -hmm. last year. Uh, and of course, uh, President Zuma's uh, decision to fire Minister Nene, then replace him with an unknown person like uh, David van Royen and then remove him four days later and appoint Pravin Gordon. Now, I interviewed uh, Malusi Gigaba, the Minister of Home Affairs, uh, on the ANC side, and I asked him this question. Do you believe that the, those decisions that the, the uh, president had made has damaged our economy? And this is what he said. So what do you say to some of the people that say a lot of the decline in the economy is attributed to President Zuma's decision to fire Minister Nene, uh, you know, hire Van Rooyen, then fire him, and then get in Pravin Gordon. That's where the trouble began, or just uh, exacerbated the problem. What do you say to that? No, that's an, ina that's an inaccurate, opportunistic, populist argument. Obviously, from the opposition, you would expect such short-sighted analysis. The South African economy has been in trouble since 2008, when the global economic recession started. The South African economy was impacted very negatively. Over the last three years, it's, it's been growing downwards. And the growth figures have been revised every year. Each time the budget is presented, we expect a, a, a certain rate of growth. But then when the medium-term budget policy statement is presented, the growth figures are revised downwards. It's been consistent over the last three to, to, to plus years. And so the, 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 the and then compounding that situation has been the decline in the in the uh, uh, emerging economies, which by 2011-12 uh, 
uh, were the drivers of, of, of economic recovery and growth globally. The, the, the decline in, in, in big economies such as China, India, has resulted in um, commodity exports declining. All of those problems do not belong to a particular day in December or a particular four days in December. Those, those days, granted, they, they exacerbated the situation. But the, 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 the challenges that the South African economy is facing do not really, cannot be attributed to President Zuma. They do not belong to, 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 to our own making. They are part of the objective situation we are facing as a result of difficulties in the global economy as a whole. Okay, Steve, your response to that. Well, his statement and his viewpoint directly contrasts that with many of his own members in the ANC that very severely criticized President Zuma's inexplicable and ludicrous firing of Minister Nenny. Yes, there are other global factors in play with the state of our economy. But that decision at that weekend caused us to lose 179 billion rand off the stock exchange in a question of hours, 52 billion rand off our bond market, and we sat on a fiscal cliff that would have had dire consequences for our nation. So we saw this decision that was taken, and as we understand it, that many of the ANC top leadership weren't even aware of it. And it is inexplicable, and we would have liked President Zuma to have explained why he wanted to replace a minister who he commended, Minister Nenny, for doing a good job. Now, uh, Pastor Kenneth, uh, there's some rumors, and it's been bandied around in the media, that uh, the reason he wanted to get rid of Nene was that South African Airways wanted to push through a deal, and uh, uh, the chairperson, uh, I think Nene, came to butting heads with the chairperson, mm. Dudu mm. Menyeni, yeah. and because he wouldn't uh, relent on that, he was removed. Do you think there's any well, truth to that, Roman? There are many people who believe that, and uh, all evidence, circumstantial evidence, point to that fact. And it is not honest for Minister Kikaba to deny that um, that decision that unfortunate decision, an unwise decision by the president to fire an experienced finance minister did not have serious repercussions. The fact is, if it did not have, the firing of Minister Nene did not have any impact on our economy, he would not have retracted his decision within four days. He did that because suddenly there was a reaction not only internally but globally because People were asking the questions. Economists were asking the questions. This is an experienced man. How come that he's being replaced by an unknown person, an unknown backbencher? And obviously, the reactions that also highlighted the criticism that a number of business people have against government of policy uncertainty. That also compounded on that. People are saying, what is policy of this government that is that is uh, firing experienced people that have stabilized the economy, people that have ensured that uh, in, the, in the person of Minister Nene, ensured that even during global uh, economic unfortunate uh, conditions that we still have, uh, we still are able to survive. Our economy is still able to survive. Our economy is still able to move on. Now, a minister who has been able to do that is being removed by somebody totally unknown. Sherilyn, for example, have you heard any um, compelling or convincing arguments in Parliament about why the President removed Nene and replaced him with Van Rooyen? No, and we're not going to know for sure until all the books come out after <laughs> um, President Zuma's term of office. Um, what we do know for sure is what the impact has been over the last two, three mm. years, which uh, Minister Gugaba uh, sort of referred to. What we don't know is what's happening politically within the ANC. And what we don't know is whether Zuma made these decisions on his own, mm. whether he was put in that position. But all in all, I think the, the, what I would caution is this, that it works in the ANC's favor for President Zuma to be the bad guy, because guess what? The ANC are not putting him back after the next election. So whilst all opposition parties get on board making him the only bad thing about the ANC, um, this works in the favor of the ANC's election campaign because once he's gone, 
well, there's nothing else wrong because he was the only thing that was wrong. So I think we really have to stick with the issues rather than the person. We have to take the light off of the person and realize this is a collective. The ANC have always referred to themselves as a collective. They are working collectively. And when decisions like that are taken, they must take collective responsibility. That's a good point. Uh, and the question I think that's on the minds of millions of South Africans is, how do we turn this around? Pastor Kenneth. Firstly, policy uncertainty is what big business is complaining about. And secondly, the, the conditions must be created uh, for investments to take place. When conditions are not conducive for economic growth and investments, then it becomes difficult for those, including domestic investors, to have, who do not have confidence in their own economy to invest because the conditions are not right. And now, foreign, foreign investors are looking at domestic investors. And they, they conclude that if domestic investors are not confident in their own economy, there must be something wrong. So they also are not encouraged to come and invest. So there is much that government still needs to do so that the domestic investors become confident in their own economy so that they invest in their economy. And when that happens, we believe that foreign, foreign, investors, foreign investors will make South Africa a preferred uh, investor uh, mm. destiny. Mm. Sherilyn, what do you think is the primary fear of investors? Of course, property rights is a, is a big issue, and, and it's a, a very questionable issue with the sort of legislation that's being passed at the moment, or at least put forward at the moment. Um, so uh, we need to really display, and, and any government taking over from the present government needs to display a lot more um, of a tendency towards making sure that people feel secure and stable, that what they do invest in this country will not be whipped out from under their feet. And we've seen mm. that happen in Africa. People have seen it, so it's not, sure. it's not something they're imagining. They mm. know what can happen. So, so this has to take place. And then the other thing, of course, is that more broadly speaking, um, I think South Africa in general do not have a sense of how important it is that good, honest, hard work is the only thing that's really going to get us where we want to be. And that means every single one of us have to take responsibility where we are to make sure that we are producing good, honest, hard work that will result and, and will produce the fruits. I don't think we have that kind of culture mm. um, in South Africa yet. It's been created. The kind of culture that's been created in South Africa is Our that... Our politics has poisoned um, right. people's responses um, and, and, and it's, it's caused people to be stepping back from the thing that is going to cause growth and focusing on the games, yeah. the, the political games. Create a sense of entitlement. We have to go to a break and when we come back we'll pick up the discussion. But I also want to talk about the racial conflict. Sure. What's behind that? What's stoking it? Some more from the ACDP when we come back. Don't go away. Welcome back to the program. I'm speaking to the ACDP MPs, Reverend Kenneth Meshew, Sherilyn uh, Dudley, and Steve Swat. Now, Steve, coming back to you, one of the positive things that came out of all of this financial woes and everything that happened after the three finance ministers was that the president had to meet with big business. Yes, that was very positive. Yeah. And we saw when the new minister of finance, Pravin Gordon, was appointed, he met with 60 of the CEOs of the country where they then discussed exactly what were the financial constraints to economic growth in the country. And then President Zuma met with 100 CEOs before the State of the Nation address and took to heart what they had to say. And you could see it from a number of the aspects and the focus in his speech on economic growth. And we trust and believe that this would restore a degree of investor confidence which was lost when Minister Nenny was fired. That would take some time to uh, improve, but we did see when the speech was relieved, released a degree of improvement in the currency. The RAND strengthens slightly, and we hope that that will be an ongoing relationship. Business must not be seen as the big enemy. Business is there to create jobs, mm. and government should come alongside business to create the environment. And of course, we need to see labor in part of that partnership. That's where the Asian tigers have grown, where they've had a partnership between government business and labor sure. to take the country forward to address poverty, unemployment that we see in our country. Mm. And so that is very promising, and we hope that it will go forward. Now, Sherilyn, I had the opportunity to speak to one of South Africa's leading businessmen, 
uh, businessman, um, Christa Visser of the Pepco Group. I think he's about the third or the fourth richest man in this country. And one of the things I asked him was, you know, can we turn our, our economy around? And he said, uh, we have to kill some of the holy cows. And I asked him for an example. And he said, the state-owned enterprises, the SOEs, the fact that we're hiring people and firing people and, you know, investigating people, this is draining billions from the South, Africa, uh, South African economy. You agree with that? I partially agree with it. When it's a holy cow, yes, we have to get rid of it. But I would also caution, because we've seen in the, the, the UK where they've sold off some of their, their assets in that way and they, had to, and they were completely driven down, like um, the transport, and it was driven down, handed back with nothing. And we saw a little bit of that with SAA and, and, and other times that we've tried to actually do away with SOE. So I think there's not um, one size fits all. I think everything has to be looked at individually, but it, but management and um, not just accountability of management, but also the ability of the management that are being put in place in the first place. Are they fit for purpose? Are, uh, um, are they uh, guaranteed to give us the results we want in terms of their track record? So these are the kind of things that are, that are very important. So whether it's state owned or whether it's privately owned, you know, human beings are human beings, whether they're private or <laughs> within the state, and there's all sorts going down. So we, we, we mustn't oversimplify these issues. And I wouldn't be inclined to want to sell off everything particularly quickly. I'd make sure that we were able to manage them in the way that they should be managed with the expertise of private business being able yeah. to come on board with in-state owners. Mm. I think the best thing to do in this case is to go into partnership. Yes. It is a fact that many state-owned enterprises do not have the skills and the expertise that can be found in big business. So rather than the state wanting to run these enterprises on their own without the involvement yeah. of business, I think that is the mistake they're making. So if they go into partnership and where they realize that without business they have been failing dismally, then they need to bring uh, more, uh, maybe f almost even 50% of uh, private sector into business, in, into the state, so that they work together. With the partnership, I believe that we can be able to save some of the SOEs. But government definitely on its own has failed on a number of issues. But rather than just throw everything out of the throw everything out of the window, they must go into partnership. And partnership. I think partnership would work better. Because because then they would have the benefit of the experience and yeah. the managerial oversight mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. that big business will bring, sure. uh, obviously, to government. Yeah. Moving on to the racial conflict in South Africa. A lot of people are concerned about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Kenneth Meshu, uh, we see it escalating on social media, uh, people calling each other derogatory names. Uh, there was recently the picture of a, a activist at UCT with, uh, uh, on his sweater was written, uh, kill all white people. Uh, they've been investigated that. They found that it wasn't a student. It's a, in fact an activist that was part of the Roads of Us Fall campaign. But it does appear to be getting out of hand. And this question I asked uh, Musi Maimani uh, outside Parliament as well. Do you think this is being stoked? There's people behind it uh, and a uh, politician using the race card is just exacerbating the problem. Well, government has had a bad habit of blaming uh, apartheid and also using the race card whenever they failed, which was bad. But at the same time, there's been a number of politicians, including the EFF, who have said they want, they want to move away from the path of reconciliation that was started by Nelson Mandela and have revolution. You know, talking about revolution, which both the ANC and the EFF are doing all the time, is not helpful. That's why the voice of the ACDP and the church it's going to be very critical these days to ensure that sanity prevails. That's right. We believe in reconciliation. And obviously, in my response to what the president has said, I'm going to bring in the issue of reconciliation. South Africa is such a beautiful country, such a wonderful country. If all race groups in South Africa can come together and pursue the path that was started by Mr. Mandela, the former president, which is a biblical thing, that there must be reconciliation in the, in the land, then South Africa will become a model for the nations of the world. South Africa will be a wonderful example for the nations of the world to follow. So we cannot support people who are saying white people are all white people are racist, and also all 
and, and some even say black people cannot be racist. I mean, that is nonsense. Mm. You have individuals among the white group who are racist. You have individuals among the black groups who are racist. So to clump a race group together and say they are all bad, they are all racist, it is wrong. So what we say in response, I think, is going to be very important and it's going to determine whether we, fee we win this debate. So I'm appealing to Christians out there that if you are a Christian, show love of one another. Love people of a different race group, have lunches together, play together, do things together so that people can see that it is possible for South Africans to work together and to love together regardless of racial mm. backgrounds. Now, Steve, we started a, a campaign called SMS Rise. Yes. And the reason we did that was in response to all these um, Zuma must fall, fees must fall, everything must fall. Mm. And I said that pretty much if everything must fall in this country, the nation will fall. Absolutely. It's negative. Yeah. No, absolutely. But there's an accountability when you, you can hold the, the president accountable. Yes. When I've spoken on the, uh, the no confidence debate, I distinguish between the person. I say President Zuma is a very likable person, he's very affable, but he must be held accountable for the decisions that he has taken. Henry Truman, one of the greatest, Harry Truman, one of the greatest American presidents, said the buck stops with me. That's so right. it's a question of accountability. But I want to agree with you and, and commend you for, for the campaign of South Africa Must Rise. It's time for the church to arise. Sure. This is a spiritual sure. issue. Sure. It is a spiritual issue that needs to be dealt with in prayer, the issue of racism, and action. So we need to be praying against the rising spirit of racism because we know the anarchy and violence that it can cause but we also need to reach out with love and reconciliation. And each one of us search our own hearts as to what role we are playing and what, how we can contribute to a healthy, peaceful, and loving South Africa on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have a role as leaders to take up that role. And it's wonderful because we are the ambassadors of the Most High Christ. And his ministry was, mm. as our leader has said, that of reconciliation mm. and love. Cheryl, in your comment with all the racial things that's happening in our country. Well, of course, we are a diverse society. Yes, we and are. And none of us has a future unless it's a shared future. So South Africa has no future unless it's a shared future. And we all have to be take responsibility there. And it's no good just because we're hearing a lot of anti-white sentiment um, and that it's totally unfair and it um, doesn't make any sense. It's no good white people then feeling completely justified to continue as they continue as well because every one of us has to take responsibility for the words that come out of our mouths sure. and our attitudes sure. and the way in which we conduct ourselves in yeah. this nation yeah. in terms of a allowing us to share this nation. It's, it's very important. We leave people behind. They are going to be angry. They're also going to have nothing to lose and they therefore are going to actually do um, desperate things that are going to harm us all. So we all need to take responsibility. None of us need to feel that we're on the right side or the wrong side. We are in this together, but we owe it to each other, to put it right. Now, this is, of course, where we as Christians should really understand that we, are, uh, more than anybody, should understand the need for unity, for forgiveness, for reconciliation. Sure, sure, These right. are the important basics. And if we get trapped mm. into this bitterness and anger and hatred and speaking back and re reacting to things that people say, we really should know that people will do say things out of pain. And when a finger gets put on past hurts, people can react in some terrible ways, but it's our responsibility not to then react to that. But we need to come in an opposite spirit and we need to actually be there for those people and recognize it's not about us as blacks or whites. It's actually about the pain that that person is feeling at that particular time. Yeah. And we can be a part of the solution. And you know, that's why I'm so blessed you guys are in parliament. They're presenting us and more importantly, uh, representing biblical Christianity. Because you see, everybody can follow, you know, and, and somebody can get up and shout and scream, and people can follow emotionally and get involved with that kind of thing without understanding or without thinking, where is this thing eventually leading us? Correct. Absolutely. You Correct. see, now because you're led by the Spirit of God, you're sitting in that place and you can understand, the Spirit of God is telling you, this is not right. Correct. Yeah. We, we, we can't get involved with this. Yeah. And, and so you can, you can bring about a different spirit right. in that parliament. Right. And you've done that a right. couple of times, mm. you know, your no, meeting we'll with, the speaker, sure. uh, with the speaker, mm. Black and Betty, when she apologized to Malema yeah. after calling him a cockroach. Yeah. You guys were behind that because sure. you understand how critical 
that Ministry of Reconciliation is bringing peace and healing and reconciliation because if we all just follow these four campaigns and all the other things that's happening, what happens to this beautiful country? And you said it, Pastor Kenneth, this is a beautiful country hey. with a huge potential. potential. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the enemy wants to come in and destroy mm. all of that and he's going to do that through division and, of course, using uh, the fault lines of racial division that are past and, and keep on pressing on that button. We've run out of time. We're going to come back later with the ACDP members, and we're going to talk about some of the legislation that is going to be tabled in Parliament soon and that you need to be aware of. Welcome back to the program. I have my great privilege to speak to the ACDP members of Parliament, Reverend Kenneth Meshu, Sherlyn Dudley, and Steve Swart. Now, we're talking about the racial conflict or you know, the despondency in people's hearts in this nation. When I travel around and speak to people uh, in Gauteng and Limpopo and wherever I travel, the Eastern Cape, one of the common things that people say to me is that we're growing more and more despondent because we don't hear our leaders speaking, the Christian mm. leaders. Mm. God has given the church the ministry of reconciliation mm. to mm. bring forgiveness, but the church is not really getting involved. All we hear mm. are the voices of Malema and all the people mm. shouting and screaming and bringing uh, uh, instability in the nation. Mm. What do you say to that, sir? You know, the issue of relationships, there is no better group of people in our country that can give better direction, that may end up with uh, unity than the church leadership. We have pastors whose voices are not heard. And may I use this opportunity to challenge our pastors at home and say, men of God, the anointing you have is not only for the few people, if you have thousands, the few thousand people you have in your church, but it is for the nation. We must become all nation builders. Remember that when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, not individuals or families. His emphasis was nations. So pastors, I believe, need to use their voices and the opportunities they have to become true ministers of reconciliation. Reconciliation is not needed the most within the church environment. It is needed throughout the nation. That's we right. have a nation that has an opportunity before God to be a blessing to the rest of the world in this matter of reconciliation. So, ministers of God, please, I'm appealing to you as your colleague that you need to speak out and give direction because many people in your churches are saying, why is my pastor not saying anything? Because the Bible says he is a minister of reconciliation. So, I plead that rather than allow unbelievers to run in the agenda of reconciliation or even of racism in the country, we can counter that with the opposite spirit and start talking about love for oneself, love for God, love for one's neighbor, and also the importance of reconciliation. If the church takes leadership in this matter, I believe South Africa will turn around and this issue and this debate of racism will end up you know, on a positive note, Amen. when all race groups shall have come together under God, we will have to be one nation under, under God. God. That's our prayer, yeah. to be a nation, even though we, are, we have diverse backgrounds, but we are one nation, consisting of black, white, colored, and Indian. What a mixture of people that can truly make the rainbow nation. It's all possible, but ministers, it is your responsibility. Yeah, I think everybody agrees that they can see it's the tactic of the enemy to bring the vision and using mm. racial conflict to do that. People know it, but still they get caught in that trap. Mm. But uh, Shirley, I just want to bring you in here, and we want to talk about some of the legislation that is uh, you know, on the back burner uh, that may be pay, uh, uh, tabled in Parliament this year. And, and one of the things that we're concerned about, obviously, is uh, the law reform on prostitution. Now, recently, the um, uh, Amnesty International, the global human rights organization, came out with a report saying that, you know, decriminalized or legalized prostitution is the only way to go to protect women in prostitution. And the research that we've seen uh, obviously denies that. Yeah. Uh, it, there's, mm -hmm. it, there's no such thing. Once you decriminalize the sex industry, you trap women and vulnerable children in the sex industry even more mm -hmm. and legitimize mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the pimps and the crime syndicates that exploit them. Your comments? Well, of course, the African Christian Democratic Party has been speaking out on the, this issue for the longest time within the National Assembly and on, in public forums and public debate. And we have managed to date to keep the legislation as it is 
and we do not see the decriminalization mm. as yet. We also um, have managed to ascertain that the majority of people in South Africa are not for decriminalizing prostitution. And sure. it's very important that when we have these hearings that, that the access is given to communities because communities know what that sort of thing is doing to them and their families in that community. It's also um, law enforcement is very important. How they're dealing with these things is very important testimony when it comes to hearings. It's the same um, with on the witchcraft um, report now as well. What will be very important to read is the input from law enforcement. But in, in principle, people should have the right to believe what they believe exactly. and they should have the right to express that belief and they should have the right to act on that belief. But then you can also lose that right if you are in fact um, constantly encroaching on other people's rights and people, particularly people's right to life. And, and that is a, a foundational value in terms of running from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible is this, um, the importance of human life. And you cannot have respect for human rights if you have no respect for human life. Okay. So, Steve, I want to bring you in here. Uh, hate crimes legislation. Now, we've seen in the media that the uh, ruling party is b working on finalizing hate crimes legislation. They've been talking about this for a number of years, but now I think they they uh, escalating the process because of all the the uh, uh, apparent uh, hate crimes and calling people derogatory names. Um, my concern, obviously, with the hate crimes legislation is uh, the sexual orientation clause in there, in that mm -hmm. uh, if uh, pastors preach that homosexuality is a sin, as the Bible clearly says it is, that they would be criminalized for doing that. They can be prosecuted and imprisoned uh, if they preach the Bible. So in effect, uh, this piece of legislation, if it's passed and signed into law in South Africa, can criminalize the Bible. Well, we need to be very careful as Christians. We need to be very vigilant. I also heard the Ministry of Justice speaking about accelerating that bill because of the racism that arose. Now, my view to that is use the existing legislation. There is sufficient existing legislation in terms of the equality courts, in terms of the criminal law, to deal with racism. Why do you now have to make a specific crime and send people to jail for that issue? But Besides that, we need to be very careful about the very specific issue you've just raised. Under the cloak of this hate crimes bill is this particular issue that we could well criminalize the preaching from the pulpit about homosexuality. Absolutely. I've heard um, some MPs have said in the past where we're talking about just discussing loosely about this hate crimes bill. Um, they said if, for example, I say, based on John 14, verse 6, that Jesus Christ is the only way. I'm saying, in essence, that all others are wrong. And it would be wrong for me to say that because it would be helpful for other religions to hear that they are all wrong, I am right. And so we will be watching to ensure that I will not, and we will not be criminalized, no church will be criminalized for believing in John 14, verse 6 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the mm. Father except through me. So it, this is a trap, and they, they need to be thankful. All the viewers out there must be thankful to God that the ACDP is in Parliament, because it's, I believe it's only the ACDP who will be vigilant to ensure that that does not happen. I have spoken to MPs who want to do that, and obviously we are not going to allow them to do that. That is why the relevance of the ACDP standing on behalf of the church in government to ensure that our freedom of belief is protected, our freedom to preach what we want is protected, as long as we also obviously respect the freedoms of others. And in the process of preaching, we do not undermine the rights of others. Obviously, yeah. when I say Jesus is the only way, I don't think I'm undermining anybody's right because I'm just quoting what the Bible says. Absolutely. And there is one belief that I would be prepared to go to jail for. Jesus is the way, the truth, and sure. the life. And is the only way. The only I would way. say that publicly and stand in Parliament and say that. Mm. 
Um, and there's nobody that could ever change that. I yeah. mean, that's, that's our belief system. Sure. Errol, it may be very important for us to say, though, that freedom of belief and freedom of speech is not something that's going to be a cover-up for genuine hate speech. Sure. Because if someone is preaching from their pulpit hatred of homosexuals and, in, and in, um, inspiring other people to go out and harm people, we must be in defense of, of people's sure. human Absolutely. rights. Sure. What we're talking about is the freedom to talk about the damage that can be done by that lifestyle not hatred of people who choose Absolutely. to act in a certain way. So we, ha we have to get to understand we are not going to um, be in support of people who are genuinely giving hate speech to yes. hide behind freedom of religion. No, absolutely. We want yeah, true that, freedom. Absolutely. To but what, what I'm talking yeah. about is preaching the scriptures absolutely. like Romans chapter 1. Absolutely. People have to understand that uh, God loves sinners, absolutely. but he hates sin. Yes. And right. also as preachers, we must love people. We must love everybody, even those we disagree with. That's right. We must love them mm -hmm. as people while not condoning their lifestyle. That's so right. that's the difference. Well, that's the command of Scripture. Yeah. And just quickly, we've got about two minutes. I just want to ask your preparations for the upcoming general uh, um, local government elections. What is the most important things that we should be looking at, Pastor Ken? We obviously, there has been a lot of wastage uh, in municipalities that have resulted from corruption. Mm. The important thing that needs to be done is to have God-fearing, righteous people who have a servant heart, who understand that being a counselor is not to go and make money for yourself, but is going to serve the people as Jesus would serve them if he was there on earth. So the ACDP is planning to contest as many words as possible, and we are also saying those who feel a calling to serve the people in righteousness, those who want to use state resources to help the people, not to line up their own pockets, but to help the people, they should make themselves available. Because local government is about saving the people. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the closest form of government to sure. the people. Now, Pastor yeah. Kenneth, I'm glad you raised that issue because just yesterday in the news media was the Buffalo municipality misusing 700 million rand. I mean, shouldn't people by now, after 21 years of democracy, begin to think that how can we elect people into places of authority that is going to throw away 700 mm. million mm. rand with all the poverty mm. and the need mm. in this country? Mm. It is just mind-boggling, Steve. Yeah. So what we are looking for is candidates to stand for us that stand for justice, for integrity, for honesty. And we'd appeal to church leaders, if there are members of your congregations that would like to get involved, contact us and let us have candidates in every ward that can stand for honest, God-fearing governance. Absolutely. With that, we want to thank you, Pastor Kenneth Meshuf and uh, Shirlin Dudley, Steve Swat, uh, the uh, godly standard in Parliament for coming into the studio and helping us understand all of these very important issues. And again, we pray God's blessing on you uh, over the election period. Uh, thank you for what you do for the uh, standard bearers, the light bearers you are, in that very important place called yeah. the Parliament of South very Africa. Mm. We just see, uh, j having you there, how important it is for us, for this country, for Christians, yeah. and for the nation uh, uh, as a whole. So thank you. God bless you. Thank, thank you, you Errol. <laughs> thank you. That's our show for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. We value your comments and suggestions for the show. So please write to us at info at familypolicyinstitute.com. Please visit our website at familypolicyinstitute.com and subscribe to my weekly newsletter. This is my primary method of sharing critical information concerning faith, family and religious freedoms in South Africa. You can also join our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. Remember, the latest edition of Joy and Yeich magazines are available at retail stores across the country. Make sure you get your copy. Thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. And remember, keep standing.